All right, just to point out what we're doing today on the syllabus. Um, take a look at section 10.2, which is on pressure. Pretty important concept when you're looking at gases and studying gases, something we gotta be really familiar with. And uh, there is an assignment that goes with that. Part of the assignment is actually already attached to your packet. That's why it's a little thicker in the note packet than uh, it usually is. And I have a single sheet as well. In fact, I can give you that single sheet now just so you have it and you got everything. The unit and the assignment goes with it. So let's uh, get into it today. Take a look at some pressure stuff. And this is where your notepad kicks in. Um, we know gases exert pressure. Um, a lot of gas tanks, like I got an oxygen gas tank in the back room and a hydrogen gas tank in the back room, and they all have pressure gauges, something like this on here. You can measure it in different units. Pounds per square inch is a common US measure of pressure. Um, bars is another, which stands for barometric pressure. Um, there's other units of pressure as well. Gases definitely exert pressure. Starts out saying something like this. This note guy, follows the textbook really closely. So if you ever have to go back, you can always read the textbook readings that I posted for this. Um, like I said, I usually do this as an assignment, but we're doing it together instead. To describe gas fully, you need to state four measurable quantities. We need to describe the temperature of a gas. Temperature of a gas is important because it changes the velocity of the particles and how often and how vigorously they collide with something. We need to know the number of gas particles that are present. We usually measure that in the units of moles. We talk about how many moles of gas particles are present. Um, because if you've got more gas particles, you're gonna have more collisions, you're gonna exert more pressure. We look at the volume of a gas. Gases, we can we can expand their volume, give them more empty space. We can compress the gases and take away some of that empty space, but uh, that will definitely influence the amount of pressure they're exerting. And another quantity that we always pay attention to when we talk about gases is what kind of pressure are those gases under? And pressure is the one unit that we haven't talked about. We've talked about temperature before. We know what moles are. We've used volume before, but pressure is this is the first chapter that we talk about it. So since you're already familiar with what's meant by volume, temperature, and the number of particles, this section is focusing on pressure. Pressure is symbolized in equations by the capital letter P. We're gonna use a capital letter T for temperature. We're gonna use a capital letter V for volume, capital letter P for pressure. Uh, and then we need a, a, a symbol for moles as well. We deal with that later. It's not bad. Pressure is defined as the force per unit area on a surface. The force on a unit area on a surface. If we were doing a mathematical equation for that, we'd say pressure is force over area. Area being like length times width, like the surface area of this tabletop. Or if you're talking about the pressure on your body, the surface area of your body. In SI units, true metric units, force is expressed in units of Newtons. And since most of you haven't had physics yet, Newtons might be kind of like, eh, maybe heard of them before, you know, like Sir Isaac. But uh, Newtons is a very common unit, especially when you're in physics. A Newton is described as the force required to increase the speed of a one kilogram mass by one meter per second for each second the force is applied. 
ponder that for a while. I did the math on this once. It's about the amount of force that you would experience if you dropped a two liter filled two liter soda bottle on your foot from about waist high. So you just hold it right there, you drop it on your foot, you would experience what a Newton of force feels like. Now that would be a Newton of force, but how much pressure that exerts is all going to depend on the area that it lands on. If it lands squarely on the top of your foot, yeah, it's going to, you'll feel it. But if it lands on the tip of your pinky toe, like right on the nail, that's going to hurt like hell. Because you're going to take that force and concentrate it over a smaller area. And the pressure is going to really hurt. But if it's the same force over a bigger area, that's going to be a lower pressure. And that's tolerable. The definition of a Newton is fun for physics folk, but it's not very useful to chemists. To paraphrase, a one kilogram mass exerts a force of about 9.8 Newtons due to gravity, a very common number that they use in physics as well. They're always talking about the gravitational constant. Therefore, if you were a 51 kilogram person, and you're like, I don't know how many 51 kilograms is, or a 112 pound person, you would be exerting 500 newtons, 500 newtons of force on Earth's surface. So 112. I'm closer to a thousand newton person. Just want to say that. My goal in life is to stay under a thousand. It's like you know, you have to have, you have, to have goals. It used to be to stay under 100 kilograms. Now I'm just happy to stay under a thousand newtons. Anyway, the question is, how could a 51 kilogram person, somebody that weighs 112 pounds, exerting 500 newtons of force on the ground, maximize the pressure they exert on the floor? Or how much, how could a thousand newton person exert more pressure on the floor? What's one thing that I could do? Those shoes give me more area. So that would actually, my pressure. So I want to uh, oh, maximize. Handstand. I could do a one handed handstand. Yeah. Well, your, feet, or, your hands are smaller than your feet. I that's know. true. That's true. Or I could stand on one foot. That would help. Or I could pop up on one tippy toe <laughs> while I'm standing on one foot. <laughs> on my pinky toenail, yeah. which I have sharpened to a fine point. <laughs> but I can't do any of those things. Um, or might be easier than popping up on a toe. I could take that one foot and I could roll back on my heel. And say, I'm not very well balanced anymore. Too much mass to balance. I could take all that weight and try to put it back on my heel. Even a small person that's wearing heels can hurt. You know, you might be a, a hundred Newton person. Okay, you're not a hundred Newton person because then you'd be like 30 pounds, but you could be like a, 500 Newton person, but if you can take all your Newtons of force and put them on the tiny high heel of your heel, you can easily do some damage to somebody with that. Or just kick them in the nuts with a heel. That would hurt too. Could cause a puncture wound, just saying. Um, if you had a 51 kilogram person and you wanted to minimize their pressure, then we could go with the snowshoes. Um, that's what snowshoes are for. So you can walk on top of the snow instead of puncturing your way through the snow with your feet. You wanna minimize the pressure on top of the snow, or you can lie down, spread out, increase your surface area. This time of year, you got people falling through the ice all the time. You just pull somebody, some guy out of the uh, 
can't remember which river it was in Milwaukee in the connector, but it was just on the news last night. He was out on the river walking around on the ice and he fell through and they had to do a rescue for him. He died. But um, when the firefighters go there, they don't go, they don't just walk out on the ice and pull them out through the hole. They got to have something that spreads out their, their mass over wider areas. Sometimes they use sleds or like sheets of plywood to spread out their mass. And then they kind of do a belly crawl out there. So they're spreading out their mass over a big area. So they don't push down too much on that. And then they try to get a rope around the person and drag them out that way. But you don't want to be standing there on the edge because you're just going to go through as well. One of the things that I used to find mildly entertaining, let me first explain it this way. This is Kane. He's in charge of uh, junior and senior class, like class officers. So she's in charge of junior prom and senior ball and crap like that. I hate that stuff. It's like the least interesting thing to me. It's actually like torture to listen to her talk about it. And she talks about it probably for about five or six weeks of the year. So every year I got five or six weeks where I'm just listening to crap about prom that I don't care about. No offense if you like prom, but I'm a grown man. I don't care about prom. I don't want to hear about prom. I don't want to hear all the problems about prom. I don't want to hear what you're ordering for prom, what they're going to eat at prom. I don't want to hear anything. Anyway, but I'm, she knows I'm her backup. I'm her backup in case she ever needs a chaperone of the male persuasion to be there. Like if no other volunteers are there, they're still short of people, she knows I'll, I'll show up for. And junior prom, they usually have at the Wisconsin club. So. That's the Wisconsin Club. This is the sidewalk that kind of uh, goes around the building. And there's parking all back here. And back here. And on the street and all over the place. So if I ever have to do prom, which I hate, I say, fine, but you got to give me the least painful job. And the least painful job is to stand out here. I draw myself correctly. With my arms crossed and a scowl on my face. As the bouncer at the door. <laughs> Gotta make sure that they're getting into the building properly. Once they're in, they can't leave. Once they leave, they can't come back in. Whatever. So this is always in spring, like junior prom, it's usually in May. So the grass is starting to get green here, you know, usually not too bad for weather, so I don't mind. And uh, the thing that always makes me chuckle, okay, the grass area is probably a lot bigger than what I have shown here, but people will be walking from the street and from the parking lot and they want to cut the corner in the grass, which is fine for the guys, but the girls, they're dressed up for junior prom. So now they're in high heels and they step on the soft grass. Not a problem when you're on the asphalt or the concrete, but as soon as you step in the grass, what happens? It's like playing lawn darts. One heel goes in, the other heel goes in, now you're stuck. And if you're not paying attention, it's heel, heel, and then whoa, the momentum <laughs> takes the top and you do a belly flop right there on the lawn, which is hilarious, especially when the girls get stuck and they don't fall. And the guys just keep walking. <laughs> Not a good way to start out your date that day, just leaving her stuck there in the dirt. But that's all about pressure. Now, if they wore snowshoes, the problem, <laughs> we wouldn't have these problems. <laughs> then, of course, when you go on the dance floor and you step on somebody with those same heels, that can be, that can be a damaging to the toes. Which gets me back to the reason why I hate doing chaperoning at dances. Back in the old days when I was a young teacher and they made us do these things, they would take the young teacher and say, go supervise the dance floor because none of the older teachers want to do that. I don't want to see the things I've seen. And you can't unsee the same things that you've seen on the dance floor. And you're supposed to like tell them not to do things on the dance floor. And I'm like, eh, eh, eh. So then you're like, okay, now I feel like a creepster. I'm supposed to be doing this job that I don't want to be doing, and it's really awkward for me, and it's really awkward for them. Never again. I'm out. I'm out. 
put me at the door duty. Better yet, don't ask me to do it at all. Now we got young people to do that. Let's send Mr. Holland in there. He's got to do it. He's got to get the experience. Here I am in my leotard on my two feet. I've got a certain amount of pressure. I spread it out over my two feet. That's going to exert a certain amount, of, certain amount of force over a certain area. That's going to give me my pressure. If I take that same amount of force, I got moves, and I put it over a tiny little tiptoe. Now I'm going to have a lot of pressure in that small amount of space. Putting this into uh, some other terms that you could kind of relate to, for example, if I put a 2,000 pound weight on a one square foot bench, that'd be 2,000 pounds on a square foot, 2,000 pounds per square foot. A square foot is 144 inches square because it's 12 inches by 12 inches. So 2,000 pounds over 144 inches is only 13.8 pounds per square inch. Not so much. I don't know if that would hurt. I don't think it would hurt that much. But if I took the same 2,000 pounds and put it over a one square inch, well, 2,000 pounds over one square inch is gonna be 2,000 pounds per square inch. That's gonna hurt. You don't want that much force on that small of an area. PSI is a common US weights and measure for a pressure. Gas molecules exert pressure on any surface in which they collide. The pressure of a gas depends on a few things, like what's the temperature of the gas? Anybody know what happens to pressure of a gas as the temperature goes up? Increase the temperature, you increase the pressure. You don't have to know that now. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. But, um, the volume will impact the pressure. What happens when I decrease the volume? Pressure goes up. And the number of particles present. More gas particles, more pressure. For example, at high temperatures, the fast moving gas particles collide with more force against the walls of the container and therefore they exert more pressure. It's also true that with more gas particles colliding with the walls of the container, more pressure will occur. Right now, as you sit in this room, you're experiencing a lot of pressure. And it's not just from me here. It's from the atmospheric pressure that you experience. You're all accustomed to a certain atmospheric pressure. In fact, when it changes, you feel it in your ears. If it changes too rapidly, you feel it in your bloodstream because your blood will start to boil. Um, the atmosphere exerts a pressure and at sea level, that pressure is about 1.03 kilograms per centimeter squared, which is metric, yeah, whatever, or 10.1 newtons per centimeter squared. Okay, whatever that means, force over area. But if you put it into familiar US weights and measures, the normal pressure at sea level is 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's actually a pretty good amount of pressure. I mean, we can go way up from there, but remember when I said you had that 2,000 pound weight on one square foot? That was 13.8 pounds per square inch. You got more than that on your body. Every square inch of your body has 14.7 pounds. That's like a 15 pound dumbbell sitting on the end of the bar that sticks out of the dumbbell, unless it's just one of those that's built in. But every square inch having a 15 pound dumbbell on you, 
that seems pretty intimidating. That's a lot of 15 pound dumbbells. Because if you're like me, there's a lot of square footage here. So um, we don't use pounds per square inch in chemistry often, but when we start talking about pressure, I like to use it because people can relate to pounds and they can relate to a square inch. And they're like, that's a lot of, a lot of weight on every square inch of my body, a lot of force. And that's just normal sea level pressure. The pressure of the atmosphere can be thought of being as caused by the weight of the gases that compose the atmosphere. So down here at, you know, near sea level, we're like actually about 800 feet above sea level here in the Milwaukee area. But we've got a couple miles of atmosphere above us. And that's all being pulled down by gravity. That's what keeps our atmosphere here on Earth. And the weight of those gases, even though individually the particles are negligible, you take all those particles that are above us and they weigh down on us and they produce that pressure or that force on us. With that statement of mind, explain how moving from sea level to a higher altitude affects the pressure exerted on your body. I'm gonna actually draw a picture to go along with that. Here's my picture. With me so far? Johnny, what is it? Yeah. What? Now here's Johnny up here. Your, your eyes are really weirdly located. <laughs> one's at your chin, one's on your forehead. Very Picasso like of you. So you're up there. Brian's down here. <laughs> Close enough. Here. Your mouth has that like, oh, look. But anyway, <laughs> I can't draw your eyes. My board doesn't calibrate that well. So here's the idea. Um, we can't see the gas particles because they're too small. Color is gas today. Yep. Oh, like, yeah, like yeah. <clears throat> but at sea level, there's lots and lots of gas particles. You have the whole atmosphere from the edge of the atmosphere all the way down to sea level. You got all those gases around. So Ryan's down here. It was Ryan down here, right? Yeah, it looks like Ryan. He's got all these gases. They are pummeling him just pounding on them constantly. 14.7 pounds per square inch from those gases. But as you go up further into the mountain, gas thinner and thinner. Johnny up here, he's getting half the beating of what Ryan has down there at sea level. He's experiencing much less pressure. A, there's less pressure there's less of the atmosphere above him when he's up here at sea level. So there's less weight of the atmosphere above him. But you can also think of the air thinning out as you go further and further up. Gravity is pulling it down, all these particles down. It's more concentrated down here. The gas particles become more diluted as you go higher and higher in altitude. So you experience less pressure at the top of the mountain. With that statement in mind, we're supposed to explain how going to higher altitude affects us. At higher altitudes, there are fewer gas particles present to collide with your body and exert pressure. And there's a limit to how high in altitude you can go before your body can't tolerate it anymore. There's a certain limit of uh, oxygen that you need to keep your body thriving. And when you exceed a certain altitude, you deprive your body of oxygen and you begin to die. In mountain climbing, they call it the dead zone. Of course, you got to climb Mount Everest to usually get there. Speaking of Everest. Um, 
we've got different units that we can use for pressure. We haven't learned all the different units. Right now we're talking about pounds per square inch, which isn't very useful since we don't use it in chemistry that much. But uh, one of the common units for pressure that we will use in chemistry is millimeters of mercury. Uh, Weatherman uses inches of mercury in the United States to describe the barometric pressure. Internationally, they use millimeters of mercury to describe the atmospheric pressure. But if you're at sea level, you experience 760 millimeters of mercury of air pressure as considered a normal day. You don't think about that. Even though it's 14.7 pounds per square inch, you're acclimated to that. That's what you experience every day of your life. It doesn't feel like anything to you. Your internal pressure pushing outward is also 14.7. So you're, you're in equilibrium, you're in balance. 14.7 pushing this way, 14.7 pushing that way. Everything's hunky-dory, you don't think about it. And by the way, in that 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure of air, the partial pressure of just the oxygen in that air is 160 millimeters of mercury. That's the part that you can breathe. But as you go up into Mount Everest and you start getting higher and higher, you know, we're talking kilometers here. So you're talking five, six, seven, eight kilometers, almost in altitude, 29,000 feet. The air pressure goes from 760 down to 250. That's a huge drop. And the pressure of oxygen that you have to breathe goes down to 53 millimeters of mercury. At 53 millimeters of mercury, there's not enough oxygen there to keep your cells going and keep your organs alive. So when you get up to the peak, you're literally dying until you go down to a level where there's enough oxygen to sustain your body in, in a healthy way. Most climbers on Mount Everest supplement their climb with oxygen, but for the hardcore climbers, they want to do it without oxygen. Of course, they'll have a Sherpa carrying all their stuff for them, but, but they don't want to do it with oxygen because they want to be hardcore. You know, you, got, you always have to have a way of differentiating yourself. Like when I climb Everest, I'm going to carry somebody on my back just to you know, make myself better than everybody else. Maybe I'll just pick up one of the frozen corpses. Apparently, there's like a thousand of them on the, on the mountain. Just pick up one of the frozen corpses. Because when you die in the Everest, they just leave you there. It's too hard to take you down and you just freeze into the ice. They leave you there. But anyway, um, you go up to the top, you're in the dead zone. You got to come back down to a certain level before you can start breathing normally and uh, have enough oxygen to keep going. Or supplement your oxygen where an oxygen tank. Yeah, they got some that, that have done it. How do they get down? They just like a sled. Toboggan. <laughs> Same way they got up. They climb all the way down. Yeah. Well, they go down to base camp. There's there's base camp, and then there's a, a higher base camp. There's like a couple different base camps that you, you can. But you get up to the highest level, which is in the breathable zone, barely. And you spend the night there. A lot of people like breathe oxygen or breathe supplement their their oxygen like the whole night and then if the weather's right in the morning you go up you make your ascent get up there as quickly as possible take some pictures and get your ass back down to the safe zone again even the safe zone's not that safe because the weather can kick up and kill you at any time um the story here is that the interior of a tanker car was washed out and cleaned with a steam cleaner. Then all the outlets, the pressure valves were shut and the tanker car was sealed. All the workers went home for the evening. When they returned, this is what they found. So the idea is this, like a tanker car, you see them like when the trains go by, you see them. I, my favorite thing to do is figure out what's in them because they have to label certain amounts, especially if it's hazardous. So they'll tell you it's sulfuric acid going in that car, for example, or hydrochloric acid going by in that car. Um, sulfuric acid is the most commonly used acid. We use it in oil refinery and plastics and stuff like that. So you see lots of sulfuric acid cars going by. But sometimes there are food things like canola oil or peanut oil or some other kind of food oil. Um, but like, let's say this tanker car was hauling peanut oil in one shipment, but in the next shipment, it was gonna haul canola oil, 
you can't just put something that had peanut oil in there and you can't put canola oil in there because then you would have people with peanut allergies dying from your canola oil. So you have to wash it out. So they get in there with a pressure washer, they unscrew the hatch. I can't see where the hatch is here. Not the best picture, but there's usually a hatch there. You unscrew it, open it up, you climb in there, you take the pressure washer, you steam clean it, get all those oils out of there so it's ready for the next batch. But when you do that, the gases that you have in there are hot gases because it was like steam. And uh, when you seal it up, you have the hot gases in there. They're exerting a certain amount of pressure. Keep them. Okay. And uh, as it cools down overnight, those hot gases become cool gases. But when hot gases become cool gases, their pressure goes down. If the gases can't go in and out because the hatches are closed, you create a pressure difference from the outside and the inside. If you have 14.7 on the outside and you only have maybe one, at, uh, you know, one PSI or 0.5 PSI on the inside, that pressure difference can be enough to cause an implosion of the tanker car. Check this out, it's my favorite video. This is apparently this what they do in Germany. Right. This is your slash gym, the guest bedroom. Don't you wish that would go on for another two minutes? Once the music kicks in and the slow motion stuff, then it's all like, oh, I guess some more of that. Problem. This thing's going to collapse. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> I, I found this one today. I was looking to see if there was an extended version of that one with the music. There wasn't, but um, I found this one. This is a company that does trailers for semis that are tanker trucks, you know, for hauling milk and oils. And it's North America's leading producer of semi trailers and liquid transportation systems, Wabash National Corporation. Anyway, let's get to the good part. They go on forever. I mean, it's like <laughs> five minutes of them talking Train. about this. So here they got training. They got a pressure gauge there that's sitting right there, I think. And uh, they got a camera on the inside on one end and the other end. So you're looking down from the back to the front and the front to the back. And obviously light on in there so they can see what you're doing. Jason, Jack, start the engine. So now they're going to pump up the gases. It takes like nine minutes to get the gases out of there. So we can go, kind of go forward here a little bit. See the pressure gauge over here in the faded out area going down. Oh, I don't want to be there yet. Oh. Okay. That was a little bit too close. Let's go back. Nine minutes. So over here, they're going to show, show in slow motion. Keep in mind, that's just air pressure. Inside. Watch this guy jump. <laughs> Well, it's like nine minutes of wait, and then all of a sudden, in one second, it does it. So, yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. It would be better if it had music to it. And, and you know, the thing that I think is impressive is you ex you experience fourteen point seven pounds per square inch all the time, and it's like no problem. I got this. But it's when there's a pressure difference between the inside and the outside 
that's when you have problems. If your pressure inside your body was 0.5, you could be compacted like that tanker car was. Or flip it around, if you had 14.7 on the inside and like 0.5 or zero on the outside, you'd swell up like the marshmallow man. That's why you never roll down windows in a space shuttle for the space station. When the pressure goes, you just expand. Your body is, if you go up like climbing a mountain, you're gonna equalize with your surroundings. So what if Likewise, you if you scuba dive and you go underwater where the pressure is much, much greater, you'll equalize to your surroundings if you do it slow enough. But if you do it quickly, you implode or explode. By the way, submariners, they don't like to see that video because we've had a couple subs that have not imploded entirely, but they've had structural, like the supports that keep it from imploding have failed. And for one of them, the thresher, I think it was, the engine room side kind of imploded and pushed the engine core out through the rest of the ship while it was underwater. So that killed like everybody. Like, would you just... You'd be called a Sherpa. Would you just be like... A Tibetan Sherpa. Would you just be adapted to... They have, they have some of the best lung capacity. That's why they do it, because they have, they have a superior lung capacity of, of man, and they're by, therefore they're the, the, the guides that will take you up the mountain and show you the path and carry your stuff for you, because you, you weaklings that grew up at sea level don't have enough uh, lung capacity to do it on your own. They, they only breathe like once a month. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we're looking at Johnny's head. Put his ears in the proper place. One of the places that you experience uh, pressure changes where you can feel them is when you uh, when you go uh, up in the air quickly, like in a plane, or if you go underwater quickly, you can feel it that way. Um, Give you an idea what we're looking at here. You got the ear canal, you got the eardrum right here, where you don't want to damage the eardrum and blow this out. It's a little bit uh, concave, kind of pulls in a little bit here. So it kind of looks like that. Um, and then you got that, you know, swirly thing. It's not an eyeball. That's the you know thing with all the hairs in it that can sense uh, sense all the sounds and stuff. You also have this tube here, which connects to your sinus cavity. This is called the eustachian tube. It's why like if you pinch your nose and blow, you can make like a little squeaking sound in your eyeball and in, in, in your, your ears and stuff like that um, because this connects to your sinus cavities. This is also what gets clogged up when you, when, uh, when you get like a sinus infection and stuff, when you get all snotted up with boogers and that tube gets all clogged up, then you get those pressure builds up and everybody's uncomfortable and crabby. Anyway, so let's say you're on a plane. Hop on the plane, it's gonna take off and take you to Tennessee or whatever. While you're sitting there on the runway, you've got 14.7 pounds per square inch pushing from the inside of your ear on both eardrums. And while you're on the runway, you also have 14.7 pounds per square inch on the outside, give or take a couple tenths. But you're in balance and you don't think of your ears. Fortunately, you don't think of your ears very often at all, at least not in terms of pain. But as soon as you take off, this pressure starts going down. And maybe it goes down to something like, I don't know, 11 pounds per square inch. Well, now we have a difference of 3.7 pounds per square inch on the different sounds, sides of your eardrum. And your eardrum's just a little membrane, right? So if you got more pressure here and less pressure here, instead of being concave like this, you're gonna start pushing your eardrum to look like this. Goes from concave, concave to convex, I guess. And that's not a very comfortable feeling. And if this pressure were to go down to like five pounds per square inch, a window was rolled down on your airliner while you were at, you know, 
30,000 feet. Um, then your eardrum would really push out here and you could actually blow out your ear, eardrum that way. That would be like an explosion of your eardrum because you have more pressure on the inside, less pressure on the outside, so you would explode. Now let's switch it around a little bit. What if you were going diving? When you go underwater, every 33 feet that you go underwater, you increase your pounds per square inch by 14.7 PSI. Um, I just wanted to find a number here. So if you go down to the Brookfield, bottom of the Brookfield East pool, it's 20 pounds per square inch down there. That's only 12 feet deep, right? So you go down 12 feet deep, you got 20 PSI pushing this way. You only had 14.7 when you took a breath and went underwater inside your skull. That's a pretty big pressure difference. You know, it's about five pounds per square inch, over five pounds per square inch. So that hurts. And if anybody's tried to do that without equalizing the air pressure in their sinuses, um, that's painful. So what do you do? You dive down to the bottom of the pool. It hurts. What do you start to do? Swim up. That would that'd be one solution. Don't go down any further if it hurts. No, I want to keep on going down to the bottom. What do you have to do then? You got to pinch your nose and blow out. Because what you're doing there is you're building up pressure in your skull. So now you're at 20 pounds per square inch inside and outside and the pain goes away. Scuba divers have to do this all the time. As they're going down, you know, they can dive down to easily hundred feet. Every so often you gotta pinch your mask, blow, build up some pressure in your sinuses and uh, equalize with your surroundings. Fortunately, for most people, when you come back up, your body's pretty good at releasing that pressure. It just kind of gets pushed out through the uh, eustachian tube. But for some people, if you're clogged up, and this is all snotted up, you can build up that pressure inside here and it can't escape. And then you're stuck with that high pressure in there. That's painful. It's called reverse block. So you can't go diving if you got like allergies or sinus problems because you'll get a reverse block and you'll be down there and you'll be putting all this pressure into your uh, inner ear canal. And then you go up and you can't release the pressure. So your eardrum goes out and out and out further until eventually it explodes and you come up with blood coming out of your eardrums. It happens and you gotta come up. You can't stay down there forever. And it gets more and more painful until they burst and then all of a sudden the pain goes away. I always thought when you burst your eardrum, you go deaf, but apparently most of the time they'll heal on their own. But yeah, not always, but they can't, they can. And they can't be like, doctored a little bit and I don't know what they do. Put a few stitches in your eardrum. I don't know. How come sometimes you blow your ear down where it hurts the more? Um well I, I will tell you this. Um I don't know about one your hot but the other one does like they're turning. Well that could be too that could be true. You could uh you could have one side of your sinus cavity is clogged up and the other one's not that could be a problem. Um and then you keep on pushing, you're trying to get that one ear that hurts to go better. So you keep on pushing and pushing and pushing. But in the meantime, the one that's not clogged up is getting too much pressure. So maybe you're kind of, so you that ear lower. I don't know. But one of the things I do see is when people that don't fly a lot, people that are not experienced travelers, they go up in a plane, just watch some people. Cause you know, if you've been up in a plane enough times, you know the things that you're supposed to do to get your ears to equalize. Anybody know what a few of those things are? Chew gum, chew gum, yeah. chew gum swatter, swallow and yawn. Yeah. Because this tube goes over your mandible. And if you do a yawn, it stretches the tube out. This is a flimsy little tube. It can pinch and it, you know, kink up like a hose. So if you stretch it out and you yawn and you chew, you basically massage the gases through the tube and it helps you keep your ears equalized. But I'll see people that haven't traveled a lot and they're used to, when they're Sinuses don't feel right. They're used to pinching their nose and doing that because they're used to swimming. And they'll be up there in a plant pinching and blowing. And they're just pumping more and more pressure here. And the pressure out here is still going down and down because they don't pressurize the cabin to a full atmospheric pressure. And just like, oh, that's got to hurt. All right. Uh, the atmosphere consists about 
78% nitrogen gas, 21% oxygen gas, and 1% other gases like water vapor, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, a few noble gases. But most of our gases are nitrogen and oxygen. That's what you breathe in with your lung folds. The atmospheric pressure is the sum of the individual pressures of the various gases in the atmosphere. We'll study something called Dalton's law of partial pressures tomorrow as we learn our first gas law. When we come to measuring pressure, we've got a couple uh, instruments that can be used for that. One of those instruments is a barometer. A barometer is a device for measuring atmospheric pressure. It was developed by a man named Torricelli, an Italian physicist. He made the first one by sealing a long glass tube at one end, filling it with liquid mercury at the other end, and then inverting it into a dish of mercury. And when he did that, the column of mercury fell to a height of 760 millimeters of mercury. We don't have mercury, so we have to use water. So if you took a tube like this and you filled it up with mercury and the tube was like a meter long, so this is a little bit short for the tube as well. You invert it over a tray of mercury, water doesn't do a whole lot, but water's not nearly as heavy and dense as mercury is. What mercury would do is due to the enormous density of the mercury, it would, suspend disbelief here for a second, pull down with the gravity and settle to a height of 760 millimeters above the surface of the tray of the mercury. And that would be the normal atmospheric pressure at sea level. If they took the average at sea level over a long period of time, they found on average, it always settled to 760 millimeters of mercury from here to here. But if you took this up into the mountains with you, you would find that the level above the mercury would go down. And if you took it below sea level, like take it to Death Valley, California or something like that, or uh, there's another place below sea level, the Dead Sea, I think that's below sea level now. Um, you would find that the pressure would actually go up above 760 millimeters of mercury. Basically, if there's more pressure being pushed down on this tray here, that goes up. And when there's less pressure, that goes down. So if you were to sketch your little diagram here, that's your mercury. And this would be going up to about here, from here to here. Here, here, I mean, that'd be about 760 millimeters of mercury. In the United States, they do inches of mercury. If you listen to the weathermen talking about the pressure, they'll use inches. It's like 29, roughly 29 inches of mercury. Um, but everybody else in the world uses millimeters of mercury. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's from my, my other device. I made a new one. Um, at any given place on Earth, the specific atmospheric pressure depends on your altitude or your elevation. And what are the weather conditions at the time? Um, you hear on the weather all the time, high pressure system rolling in, low pressure system rolling in. Low pressure systems like we got going right now, give you cloudy or overcast skies whether it's summer or winter, overcast skies are usually associated with a low pressure system. Um, and high pressure systems are associated with your clear and sunny skies. So um, 
weather's going to change your your pressure on a daily basis. And then if you change your elevation, like we're at 800 feet above sea level in Brookfield, roughly. So we're on average a little bit less than 760 millimeters of mercury. If you're going to uh, Denver, Colorado, they're at 5,280 feet, mile high city. So they're even lower in their millimeters of mercury on average. So here's your barometer. There's a vacuum up here because of the dense mercury, 760 is the height that it likes to be at. Put more pressure here and it goes up. Push less pressure here and it's gonna go down. Like on the top of Mount Everest, there's less pressure. So it only comes out at 253 millimeters of mercury. Whereas at sea level, it's 760. The great thing about a barometer, mercury barometer, is it's like foolproof. There's no mechanical parts in there. They don't break. I mean, you can break it. I guess you can break the tube, but it's like, it's kind of foolproof. Whereas these mechanical ones, these don't work. This one's not even around anymore. It looks like it's been dropped a couple times. <laughs> oh, so I'll probably put it down too hard. They got this dial, this outer dial with an inner dial, and you're supposed to set it to where it is right now. And then you come back a couple hours later and you can see if the, the pressure has gone up or down. Then you know if the barometer is falling or rising. And you can tell if a low pressure system is coming in or a high pressure is coming. So you can predict the weather. Right now it says change. So either we're going from high to low or we're going from low to high, high to low or low to high. But right now we're in a change mode. Uh, we already did that slide. Another device for measuring pressure is the manometer. <laughs> the manometer looks something like this. And it could look like that too. But in a manometer, what they do is they put the mercury in this YouTube area here. It's open on this end. This is where your reaction is going to take place, where your sample is contained. And separating the reaction vessel from the outside, you have this column of mercury in the U-tube. And right now, in my manometer, which I now use red mercury for, you have uh, both sides of the, the manometer equal to each other because the pressure here and here are the same because they're both open to the atmosphere. But if I were to put a reaction in there and then seal this end shut, I'll simulate that by pushing down on the stopper. If I compress those gases in there a little bit, now there's more pressure in here, less pressure out here, so the mercury shifts. And I got a ruler behind here. I can measure from here to here what distance that is. And that would be how many millimeters of mercury of pressure that were generated inside the manometer. It could go down as well. If you consume gases, then uh, you could actually have one side, this side, uh, higher and this side lower. It all just depends on if you're adding gases or reducing the number of gas particles in your vessel. So if you're doing something in the lab and you wanna measure the pressure change in a lab, you might need a manometer to do that. The height difference between the two. One end goes down, the other end goes up, and then you measure the difference between them in millimeters of mercury. It's also pretty easy to work with uh, millimeters of mercury as a pressure unit because it's something you can quite literally measure with the ruler. Let's just give you an example because you're often asked to do a calculation with something like that. Show you something like this real quick. Um, let's say we have a pressure here 
outside at 760 millimeters of mercury, pushing down at this end of our manometer. Because we know it's that because it's sea level and that's what our barometer tells us. And let's say the height difference from here to here, where the mercury is here and the mercury level is here, let's say that's a difference of 40 millimeters of mercury. If that's the case, what is the pressure of the gas inside the manometer? Ask yourself this first. Is the pressure in the manometer greater than or less than the pressure out here? Greater than. This is greater than this. It's a shoving match. You're pushing on both sides of the mercury column. Who's winning the shoving match? This is. By how much? 40 millimeters of mercury. So what's the pressure inside the manometer? 800. That's why the difference is 40 millimeters here. 760 on one end, 800 on the other end. It's not an even battle, so it shifts the mercury by 40 millimeters. Or you could have something go the other direction. Let's say now we've got on this side, we'll still keep it at 760, that's easy number to work with. Pushing down here, but now the mercury levels down there, down there. Let's say this time it was a height difference of, let's say uh, 30 millimeters. Now you're saying to yourself, who's winning the shoving match? This is. This one's pushing better than that one is. So that means the gas inside the manometer has to be less than this one. How much less? 30 less. So this would be maybe 730. You're basically going to add or subtract that number. It just depends on which way things were pushed. You got to kind of be logical about it whether you add it or subtract it. To finish things up here, and I'm gonna finish just in time, I think. Um, we've got a lot of units that we can use, metric units or proper SI units at least, that we could use to describe pressure. And it actually becomes the most annoying thing about working with pressure. You can use Pascal's, which are Newtons per meter squared. That's metric -y sounding. But Pascal's are pretty small units. So we often would use kilopascals. That's actually a pretty common one, KPA for kilopascals. We're showing you how millimeters of mercury work. That's a very common one. And one of the favorite ones is atmospheres. They just said, why don't we take 760 millimeters of mercury, normal sea level pressure, and we'll call that one atmosphere of pressure. And then we can do everything relative to that. And then there's even Torricelli's and things like that. Um, there's English, US weights and measures, pounds per square inch, inches of mercury if you're watching the weatherman. We're not gonna use those anymore. These are the ones that you need to know. 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere. 760 millimeters of mercury is also equal to 101.325 kilopascals. Those are the three pressure units that I'm gonna hold you accountable for. And you got to be able to work with those. So that's basically conversion factors. That's a conversion factor, that's conversion factors, and that's a conversion factor. There's three conversion factors because they're all equivalent to each other. Another thing, we often compare things at standard temperature and pressure conditions. If you want to compare one gas to another, you got to do it on a level playing field where the temperature and pressure and the number of gas particles are the same. So they call that STP for standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature, zero degrees Celsius. Standard pressure, one atmosphere. So this is pretty much the memorizing part of section 10 And you'll see those again tomorrow. We're gonna to use those a lot. 
The last thing I want to show you an example or two with, and then the rest of the assignment you can take on yourself, is uh, converting between units. Like, for example, the average atmospheric pressure in Denver, Colorado, the mile high city, 5,280 feet in altitude on average, is 0.83 atmospheres. They have 83% of the atmospheric pressure that we do at sea level. What would that be translated into in? millimeters of mercury. Well, 760 millimeters is equal to one atmosphere. That's a conversion factor. That enough so a kitty corner cancels. And you can figure out how many millimeters of mercury that is. And if we want to do with kilopascals, in principle, there's one of 1.325 kilopascals to one atmosphere. So we use that as a conversion factor. You want to be good at converting between millimeters of mercury, atmospheres, and kilopascals. If you can get those three working for you, you're good with pressure. This will be the last time you see PSI. I threw that one in there. I gave you what PSI is equal to, just so you could do that problem. Yeah. I'll give you the answers for those. Pressure at the bottom of the Brookfield East Pool. We got 33 more, 30, 36 percent more pressure at the bottom of the pool than what you have at the top of the pool at the surface level, and that's why your ears hurt when you get down there. Water changes the pressure of your surroundings much, much faster because liquids are so much more dense than gases. You have to change thousands of feet get that much pressure change for a gas, but you only have to change about 12 feet to get that much pressure change for a liquid. Anyway, we're going to run out of time here. Appreciate your patience, because that's a lot of notes to take. Uh, the rest of this and that loose piece I gave you are all things that you should be able to answer and work on for your assignment, which we'll check tomorrow. Joaquin Castillo, your ride is waiting. Joaquin Castillo, your ride is waiting. <laughs>